Next up we have Keith Nitty. Uh, Keith is a seasoned software developer and has been writing Ruby since 2006. He's been an active member of the Australian Ruby community since the first Rails camp in the winter of 2007 and was the committee of the inaugural Ruby Australia committee. Sorry, the president of the inaugural Ruby Australia committee. So Keith is wild about cricket and he's spent hours talking to you about it. Um, you can, if you see him later, get him to explain what a silly leg is or a cow corner or a deep backward point. There's so much strange cricket lingo. Um, and so Keith's talk today is about the feeling that you get when you work on a legacy code base and you think, oh, what were the previous developers even thinking? Welcome, Keith. Before I talk about code, I'd like to start by reflecting about country. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Now, imagine this scenario. You're under pressure. Your business owners expected you to deliver yesterday, yet you still have choices. Do you acquiesce and take shortcuts in order to meet short-term expectations? Perhaps you do. Time passes. You eventually move on to work for other organisations. More time passes. Then, one day, years in the future, you're at a Ruby conference and, by chance, you meet several developers who are now working for your old shop. You cringe <laughs> with a sick, guilty feeling in the pit of your stomach. <laughs> How can you avoid being that developer who feels compelled to apologise profusely for past sins? As we reflect on the scenario that introduced this talk, we should ask, how could the code have possibly got into such a sad state? There must have been several shortcomings that led you to feeling so apologetic for allowing your peers the unenviable challenge of trying to deal with the debt-laden code base that you left behind. Let's start by considering design. Note that I'm not referring to the design of web interfaces. Rather, I'm talking about the internal design of software. Was sufficient attention paid to this? How well did the development of your code base stack up against what Corey Haynes refers to as the four rules of simple design? These are fine rules. Indeed, they were originally from Kent Beck, so they must be fine. <laughs> but some of them beg other questions. For example, did sufficient refactoring take place? Firstly, what exactly is refactoring? According to Martin Fowler, who introduced the practice two decades ago, it's improving the design of existing code. As those of us who have learnt this practice know, it goes hand in hand with automated tests. We'll get to those in a moment. Essentially, as we develop, once a test passes, we then have the opportunity to improve the internal design, which will involve some thinking, perhaps in a pair, so that those who come after us will be thankful. So why are automated tests so crucial? Because we can't improve the design of existing code with confidence if we don't have automated tests to ensure that the behaviour remains unaltered as we attempt to improve the design. Hence the imperative to strive for test-driven development and, of course, <laughs> continuous integration. To my mind, automated tests that are not run in the CI server don't really count. So, if we've attended to the importance of design, refactoring and automated tests, is that sufficient? I don't think I've proffered anything too controversial so far, but is it sufficient? Could other factors have led to technical debt? Let's continue our reflection. To quote Dave Thomas, the one who hails from Canada and founded the Hour Conferences, 
Big design up front is dumb. Doing no design up front is even dumber. <laughs> In other words, it does pay to do some thinking about design before we start coding. This gives us a better chance of success. I think Simon Brown's C4 model for software architecture is well worth delving into here. C4 is short for context, containers, components, and code. Simon presented at Yao in late 2017 and has some excellent resources online. I'll leave that as an exercise for you. In essence, failure to do any upfront design could lead to a slippery slope. Not giving yourself a chance of a well-architected system could come back to haunt you later. I wonder if our hypothetical embarrassed developer paid heed to Dave's advice. Another key aspect of healthy software development is peer review. This has been long recognised and it has taken different forms. Back in the 1980s, review took place via structured walkthroughs. Pair programming, by contrast, allows more immediate review. GitHub pull requests have provided an opportunity to scrutinise code, uh, code asynchronously. In whatever form, review provides an early opportunity for catching bugs and improving internal design. We know this as software developers. But does it always happen? Do we sometimes give into the, the temptation for shortcuts to be taken, for code to be merged without review? Is there sometimes pressure to speed up the process by skipping review? There's often a tension between getting things done quickly and getting them done well. Has the right balance been struck? Whilst the goal of self-documenting code is laudable, is that enough? Has a helpful README document been create, uh, curated for each code repository? Has there been a culture of providing useful guides, hopefully also in the repository? Has a helpful history of the reasons for decisions been captured in Git? What importance do we give to load testing before code changes are approved? How often is appropriate load testing actually performed? Or is it more often the case that it's put into the too hard basket? Is it more likely that changes which degrade performance are applied one after the other with the result that response time gets worse and worse? How many car owners do we have in the audience? Let's have a show of hands. Keep your hand up if you ensure that your car gets a service according to the recommended schedule. I'm glad to see that some of you do. <laughs> what about planned maintenance for software? Is that something we budget for? Do we do the equivalent of changing the spark plugs for our software? Do we plan to keep our production systems up to date with security patches, for example? Do we budget for keeping our Rails applications up to date with the latest releases? How many people here support a Rails application that's in product, been in production for, say, at least three years? Keep your hands up if it's running on Rails 5.2.2 and Ruby 2.6.1. Maybe that's a little unfair, but you get the idea. <laughs> on reflection, is it more likely that software maintenance is reactive? Do we wait until problems surface in production? Let's consider technical leadership. Has there been sufficient overall scrutiny from a technical perspective? Has there been sufficient weight given to voices from a technical perspective about the aspects we've covered so far today? There's often a tension between technical perspectives and business imperatives. We obviously want to give the application the best chance of being maintained to support continuing and evolving business needs? Has there been sufficient negotiation to increase the chance that the necessary steps will have been taken to ensure this? Perhaps our embattled developer fell short in this regard. So far, we've been reflecting on what could have caused the code base to get into such a sad state. 
What should we aim to do instead to set ourselves on a better path? Logically, to ensure that the application is easy to maintain, all we have to do is do those things that we've mentioned so far. Okay, job done. I guess that's the end of the talk. Well, maybe it's not that simple. Perhaps there are other things that we need to consider. Perhaps we'll get a better chance of a good outcome if we exercise more discipline, both individually and as a team. Crucially, we need to be prepared to patiently and carefully explain the importance of good software development practices to business stakeholders. I'll return to this theme a bit later. Now, at this point, I should be clear. I don't pretend to have all the answers about how to negotiate a better outcome. However, I would like to share some suggestions based on my experience. Let's be realistic. In the lives of software developers, progress is rarely smooth. If we're to succeed in the long term, we need to be vigilant. We need to be mindful of potential pitfalls. Whilst we can keep in mind the pitfalls that have already been mentioned, <coughs> there are other approaches which we can take that might help. It seems to be negative, especially when we notice shortcomings in the life so far of a code base. I know I've certainly fallen into that trap. Obviously, there are challenges, but wherever possible, I think it pays to meet those challenges with a positive mindset. <coughs> Excuse me. So, with positive thoughts in mind, if we consider what could be a helpful overarching software philosophy, what should we be aiming for? I find it interesting that in recent times, there's been a growing movement towards continuous flow as a philosophy for our industry. A recent book by Evan Laybourne and Shane Hastie focuses on this theme, using the hashtag no projects as a title. To me, Evan and Shane present powerful reasons for resisting the impulse to form projects and instead focus on, a culture, on creating a culture of continuous value. Alan Kelly is another who has written on this theme. His book, Continuous Digital, is in my opinion an important, well-reasoned contribution. If we ponder this perspective, it's an extension of continuous delivery, which itself stemmed from continuous integration. As Evan, Shane and Alan explain, there's often no need for projects or sprints. Rather, we should aim for continuous feedback. I invite you to explore continuous flow in more depth for yourself and consider how it may benefit your organisation. Staying with the Agile theme, it's interesting to note that it's now 18 years since the Agile Manifesto was forged. Some approaches like Scrum go back even further. How well is the Agile movement serving us? I think it's a question worth asking. Indeed, in 2016, one of the original organisers of the retreat that led to the Agile Manifesto, Alastair Coburn, published a paper contesting that, quote, Agile has become overly decorated. The remedy is simple. Collaborate, deliver, reflect, improve. These four imperatives, already sufficient, expand to cover the, com the complexities of modern development. Alastair has promoted this stripping back of Agile to its essence under the banner of the heart of Agile. I encourage you to explore these imperatives, focusing on their essence, rather than getting too hung up on the various recipes for various flavours of Agile. For example, we might reflect upon how we might improve collaboration and delivery to combine the imperatives in one form. The heart of Agile can also be expanded. To collaborate involves trust, for example. Now, <clears throat> let's revisit the importance of careful explanation. How might we best influence decision makers to assist us in adopting practices that result in long-lasting, well-maintained code bases? <clears throat> I've learned to my cost that mounting a forceful argument does not necessarily pay dividends. <clears throat> Now's an appropriate time <clears throat> excuse me 
to recall the first slide of Sandy Metz's talk, which opened last year's conference. She left the audience pondering this statement while we were waiting for her to be introduced. She had my attention immediately. She went on to refer to several books in the context of coaxing, coaxing the audience to learn more about how to become more influential. I thoroughly recommend watching the video of Sandy's talk and then reflecting on how you can put some of these ideas into practice. When trying to persuade, in essence, if you, like me too often, set out to try to win an argument, stop. Rather, be more prepared to patiently explain your viewpoint and add to a pool of shared meaning. I say add to a pool of shared meaning very purposefully. This is a phrase emphasised in the book Crucial Conversations, which I thoroughly recommend. As the authors emphasise, it's more valuable to contribute to a shared understanding than to try to win everyone over to your point of view. As you may be increasingly appreciating, I'm emphasising the importance of people skills. To give a code base a greater chance of enduring in a state of good quality, what is critical? In my view, it's your ability to genuinely and patiently persuade other people. That's an art you need to practise. It's relatively easy to hone technical skills, whether it's conducting good reviews of pull requests on GitHub, implementing continuous deployment via tools such as Docker and AWS, or effectively pair programming to produce well-factored, well-tested code. A greater challenge is to persuade stakeholders that these sorts of activities are worth investing developer time in. It takes time to develop skills of persuasion. In some contexts, it will be more challenging than others. Some stakeholders' ears will be less receptive than others. In some circumstances, more creative patience will be required. Hopefully, your motivation will be to give your team's code base a fighting chance of a good, long-lasting life. This should lead you to patiently practice becoming sufficiently persuasive. You'll need to persist. If you attempt an approach to be more persuasive that fails, pick yourself up and be prepared to try a different approach. You may find it difficult. If so, consult others. If necessary, be prepared to reach out beyond your team to others for advice and inspiration. As software developers, there's a constant flow of new technologies that offer themselves for us to learn. It may be Elixir, React, or the latest offering from AWS. That's fine. Along with mastering those, I recommend that you keep an open mind to learning new approaches to becoming more effective at communicating. That is, communicating with people who don't necessarily appreciate the finer points of how to develop and maintain good quality software. This is a crucial point. They are the people who need the benefit of learning from your knowledge about how to ensure that a code base endures in a state that is both a joy for developers to work with and a fine example of one that supports its users and owners. Now that I've taken you on a short hypothetical journey, I hope that we're all in agreement. We don't want to be that developer who feels compelled to apologise to former colleagues for the state the code base was left in. How do we prevent that scenario? As I've shown, my answer is twofold. Firstly, be more disciplined. And secondly, become more persuasive. I'll leave you with some references and note that I'll make these slides available before the end of the day. Thanks for your attention. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.